Hello, everybody. I don't know if we can have some volume. Um, hello, hello. Very efficient, thank you, Richard. Richard House is here with us. Your Excellencies, official ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, dear friends, uh, welcome. Welcome uh, to this wonderful building. Thank you for being uh, here uh, to open the sustainability event promoted by the Italian Embassy in Washington and organized uh, by the Italian Cultural Institute uh, and uh, La Voce of New York. We are, of course, uh, very grateful uh, to the Council on Foreign Relations for having allowed us to be here in this amazing, uh, wonderful building. Uh, prestigious. I mean, you, you can breathe history mm -hmm. in, in these rooms. And, uh, and even more grateful we are to Richard Haas, who is the president of the Council of Foreign Relations and longtime friend uh, of uh, Italy for having joined us uh, for a few words of uh, welcoming remarks. Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mario. Enzo, always good to see you, my friend. Welcome to the Council on Foreign Relations, the Pratt House. I'm the president. One day my painting will be on the wall, but not yet. <laughs> it's a question of, uh, it's a matter of, uh, of time. I'm happy to speak in anything Italian because my wife's parents came from Gaeta to the United States, and it's her birthday tomorrow, so I kind of feel I have to do this as part of, uh, part of the presence. But anyhow, seriously, it's great to be here. Uh, I actually think Italy and U.S.-Italy relations are as important now as ever, in part because I, uh, let me, if I sound partisan, I apologize, but I'm not, I don't mean to be. I think Italy's leadership is as good as anything we have right now in Europe. I think uh, you've got a heavyweight running your country. And at a time, there aren't a lot of heavyweights on the European scene. So Italy's uh, voice now is more important than, uh, than ever. Uh, in terms of sustainability, let me say uh, two things. Uh, you know, we're, what, it's October what, 20th? Mm -hmm. So in roughly 10, 11 days, the world begins to gather at Glasgow. Uh, I am not wildly optimistic about what will be accomplished. I think uh, there'll be more words than action. Uh, there'll be commitments that I'm not sure will be fulfilled. And right now, this is as close to an existential issue as we have in the world, and we're losing the race. We're not doing enough to reduce the uh, emission of uh, greenhouse gases, whether it's carbon dioxide, methane, or anything else. Uh, we're not doing enough to uh, help those who have to adapt or build resilience either to existing climate change or the climate change to come. It's not too late. This is not a defeatist comment, but if you're not worried, you're not paying attention. And one of the messages I take from this is the role of companies will in many cases be more important than the role of government. Uh, in this country in particular, I'm, I'm, I'm not as aware in Italy, but companies are in many cases taking the lead. They have pressure from shareholders, they have pressure from employees, they have pressures from investors, and they also have economic incentive. So this is an area of real uh, public-private partnership, and I think it's an area where companies can in many ways take the, uh, the lead in uh, working uh, with, uh, the, by themselves, with one another, with, uh, with governments. There is a need for collective action. Climate change is a collective uh, challenge. Uh, again, it's not too late, but time itself is not going to resolve this. And my own country has a long ways to go. We're not where we need, we need to be, and I don't think other countries uh, are as well. Uh, we'll see what happens in the legislation uh, being considered here, but it's just a sign. You know, our domestic politics are what they are, and they're not what they should be. Uh, in terms of uh, the United States foreign policy more broadly, look, this is, this is an interesting time in the world. You know, Mario said, you, you can feel the history. Well, we're living in history. Think about it. You got the reemergence of great power rivalry, United States, Russia, China, 
very different kind of challenge from China. You've got all these global issues, climate, pandemics, proliferation, cyberspace, trade, what have you. And then we have you know, real questions in the United States about our role in the world and about the fabric of American democracy. So there's a lot going on. You know, the one thing I do not lack are issues to study. I do not lack things to, uh, to write about. So you've come here at an interesting time. And whether it's domestically in this country, domestically in Italy, uh, internationally, uh, I still think the transatlantic relationship, let me say one or two things about that, then I'll stop answering any questions or whatever. Uh, I think the uh, transatlantic relationship is still uh, significant, but I think there's real challenges in it, partially because of what's going on in Europe, uh, within most of the important countries of Europe, as well as the, the issue of uh, European institutions. But across the Atlantic, it goes beyond submarines and uh, the like. That, to me, uh, is in some ways a reflection of a problem. Yes, it has to do with consultations, but also it's the, it's the issue in this world, what is the purpose of the transatlantic relationship? Yes, there's still an anti-Russian dimension, but that can't be, that's, that's just a part of it now. The question is, how will the two sides work together on China? What will be, for example, Europeans, Europe's willingness to stand up now to tell China what it would do if China were to move militarily against Taiwan? That's the kind of issue Europe has to decide right now. Uh, what kind of technologies is Europe not prepared to see go to China, not prepared to allow China to invest in? Where can we work together on coming up with alternatives to what China, either Chinese technology or China's Belt and Road Initiative around the world? Big, big questions of transatlantic uh, relations. And then the question is, if you add up the U.S. and European economies, it's still almost half the world's economy, half the world's GDP. What are we prepared to do to shape the institutions of this era? And in, as important as anything else, will be can the United States and Europe find common cause about what we should do about climate, what we should do about the next era of trade, what we should do about regulating cyberspace? And that, to me, is uh, as important as anything we did militarily during the Cold War with NATO. The question is now, how do we do these other things? So big, big agenda for governments, for companies, even for think tanks. Why don't I stop? If anything you want to, you want to. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, okay. start maybe with a question. We'll, okay. we'll have maybe one or two. But yeah. uh, uh, you know, you touched. Uh, yeah, you touched about uh, about the transatlantic relationship. Now, if we go more in detail, you say submarines are not really important, but that has been a perception of, of betrayal in Europe. I mean, I, I was in Italy for a month, and everybody is very, very upset about it. Uh, and the transatlantic relationship itself has suffered also for Afghanistan. And, and it seems that internal problem, internal politics of the US, uh, you know, was more important. So what is your assessment? Is it really uh, in, in trouble? Was there a failure of communication from the administration? Or? Look, I think it's uh, the United States mishandled the consultations, certainly on uh, the submarine deal. I think we should have uh, invited France to be a part of this new arrangement. And I think we should have found a way to compensate France for the loss of any submarine sales. That to me, that's why God invented diplomats, to think of these kinds of arrangements. And to use an American expression, we dropped the ball. Uh, Afghanistan's more complicated. People are focusing too much on the tactics of leaving. I think the bigger question is whether we should have left in the first place. I think not, uh, the, but uh, it's a strategic question because you had, what, 7,000 Allied troops in Afghanistan. By the end, you ha we had let roughly 3,000 American troops, roughly 7,000 Allied troops, and the question is, could and should we have stayed? So to me, it wasn't a tactical question of consultation. Tony Blinken went over to Europe to talk to Europeans. The real question was whether the policy was strategically correct. Uh, look, I think we're at a point in history where if during the Cold War, Europe was the principal arena or venue of the Cold War, I do not believe Europe geographically will be the principal venue or arena of the 21st century. It doesn't mean that Europe is less important. It means it's important in different ways. So one needs to think about the US-European relationship less in terms of geography, less just in terms of NATO and dealing with Russian threats. Uh, it's what do we do together to deal with other threats, be it terrorism, the greater Middle East. As I said, what do we do about uh, the greater, uh, the emergence of Chinese power and the potential greater use of uh, 
Chinese uh, power, what are the, uh, how do we make sure our economic relations with China and Russia are strategic? I, for example, do not agree with Germany's decision years ago to get out of nuclear power. I thought that was a strategic, strategic error, and I think now Nord Stream 2 is a strategic error. So I think you know, th all the problems are not transatlantic. I think there are real issues for Europe to think about what are, how does one rank economic relationship, economic interests vis-a-vis -vis strategic interests? given countries like Russia and China. But I think the real challenge for the transatlantic relationship will be how do we make this more of a global relationship? It can't stop being a European relationship. The European arena is still important, particularly so long as Mr. Putin's on the scene, and he's gonna be on the scene a lot longer than I am. But, uh, but the real question is can the United States and Europe find ways to collaborate on global challenges, and that will, and that only if that happens will the transatlantic relationship be be as relevant as it needs to be. Thank you. We have time for two quick questions. If anybody wants to uh, have one, yes, we have Marco there, please, and 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 here, yes. Thank you, thank you, Richard, and thank you, Mario. I've been here, brought by Enzo, in my first visit to New York, mm -hmm. and it's a pleasure to see you in person now that we hopefully slide back into it. This is not in person, I'm on Zoom here, you just don't realize. <laughs> exactly. Um, one, you're a dean on studies on multilateralism, a question on methodology. Mm -hmm. Europe here, seen from here, Europe is very rule-based and has a regulatory perspective and deals a lot with far-fetched objectives and sets of pieces of paper, mm -hmm. but seen from Europe, the United States should deliver minus 52% in 2030, and there is no piece of legislation mm -hmm. underpinning it. And the idea of Chuck Schumer, amongst others, was to go to COP with at least the infrastructure package dealt with in such a way that those emission reductions through new investments, new infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, were at least cabled in. So how can we reconcile the difference in political processes in such a way that they do not become a lack of trust amongst the two sides of the pond? Look, I don't have a good answer to your thoughtful question. Uh, I think we have become more difficult to deal with. We've never been simple. There's always been a degree of uncertainty. You know, unlike European systems, which are parliamentary, we have divided power. That is the nature of the American political system. It's been this way for 240 years. And whether it was the United States not joining the League of Nations after World War I or other times, we're, there's a degree of structural unpredictability. Now, this is, was dramatically reduced uh, during the Cold War when there was a large consensus. I think now it's pronounced in part because there's no consensus in the United States. In part, also, the Republican Party is fundamentally different. The Republican Party, I would argue, is no longer a party that you might describe as loyal opposition. It's, a, it's become a, I've been a, I was a Republican for over 40 years. This is not a party I recognize. So it's introduced another dimension of uh, uncertainty. Uh, that said, there are surprising similarities between Mr. Trump and Mr. Biden, uh, whether it's opposition to trade, getting out of Afghanistan, a tough line about China, more concerned about domestic things. So you're beginning to see the outlines of a, uh, what I would call a post post-Cold War American foreign uh, policy. But I think places like Europe have to take into account that the United States is a little bit less predictable than it was. And you're going to have to decide what you do. And I think you know, there's lots of different ways you could go. The French have their ideas, the British have their ideas, and so forth. And I think Italy and the EU are going to have to decide how is Europe going to promote what it sees as its self-interest and insecurity at a time when the United States is divided at home and we're, we've become a little bit less uh, predictable. And it's, there's real questions then about European defense effort, uh, obviously. There's real questions about how Europe deals with places like China and Russia economically and whether it allows itself to become so economically dependent uh, or energy dependent uh, on a place like uh, Russia. So, I actually think this is a time, it, it's not for European autonomy, that's too extreme. But the issue is, what are Europe's priorities in a world in which you've got a rising China, a problematic Russia, an unstable Middle East, 
and the United States a little bit less reliable and predictable than it was? That, that's a big question, I would think, for Italy and for all of and Europe. That's a question for you to debate and answer. And, I, and in part, I can't tell you how long this phase of American domestic or foreign policy is going to exist. My, my suggestion is it may go on for a while, though, certainly our foreign policy. The fact that there's considerable continuity between Trump and Biden leads me to think that what you're seeing now is a version of what you're going to see for some years to come. Please, last question. <laughs> Quick question. Do you want to open to American visitors back in June? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, Europe open to American visitors yeah. back in June. Uh, Americans is open uh, is opening to from visitor from Europe maybe in November November eight. What is your ta take on this? How come this lack of reciprocity? Look, uh, I'm not wild about it. I think uh, from the beginning, the closure of borders seems to me. If I were going to make a list of all the things that would really affect the ability of a society to manage COVID, that would not be on my top five. It might not be on my top ten. Uh, you know, the, you know, if more Americans got vaccinated, wore masks, and the rest, this would not even be an issue. I think it has to do a little bit with politics, a little bit with bureaucracy, but it's, it's going to disappear. It's going to go away in a couple of weeks. Uh, it's, I think it's unfortunate it's taken this long. I think it's an inappropriate uh, policy, but I think it, it reflects the, the politics and the, uh, I, again, I think it's a mixture of politics and bureaucracy. Bureaucracies are, you know, I've worked in government for 20 years. Bureaucracies are not uh, comfortable taking risks. If you open up your country and bad things happen, it leaves you politically a bit vulnerable. Uh, so I think we've been, ex we've been cautious to a fault here. And the only good news is that come November 8th or 9th, uh, things will, I believe, uh, change. And I also think Things are changing in this country. The combination of uh, boosters uh, now, the um, young people getting vaccinated. We're going to move to increasingly vaccinate uh, children so parents will not come into the workplace having picked up COVID uh, at school. We're getting more therapeutic drugs to deal with COVID if you, if you get it uh, all the same. Testing is finally getting a little bit better in this country. So I think my, my sense is we're, unless the unexpected happens, I think we're the worst is behind us, and I think not that we'll go back to exactly the way we were, but things will become a lot more normal. And I think uh, coming here, leaving here, living here, working here will become a little bit uh, or considerably easier in the weeks and months to come. And I hope you will come and live and work and visit here. Thank you. Thank you all. That was um, very interesting, of course. And uh, let me ask now to the podium the Consul General of Italy, Fabrizio De Micheli, and the organizers of the event, Fabio Finotti, the director of the Italian Cultural Institute uh, in New York, and Giampaolo Pioli, the chairman of La, Va La Voce di New York, for a few words. Please, if you can join me here. Si, venite tutti, così I think we all, we all come. Good evening all, uh, ladies and gentlemen and, and dear friends. Actually, I would like to follow on what Richard has just said, but since I want to keep my job because I've been here just for a few months, uh, I better confine to my introductory remarks to the seminar. Our Consul General <laughs> is an expert on Russia, so we are very curious. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I it better shut up. <laughs> no, I, I'm here really um, just for a few thanking remarks. A as you know, uh, the Ambassador of Italy uh, tomorrow morning will uh, open up the, the session. And um, first of all, I, I want to thank the Council on Foreign Relations so for hosting us and uh, Professor William for, for being our keynote speaker. But allow me to say that I'm, I'm very proud for this event because I was reading before over and over again actually the, the, the program, the organizing committee, the, the participants, and I have to express my, my genuine gratitude for to all the actors 
starting with the, the Italian Institute of Culture and, and La Voce di New York, for organizing um, this seminar. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how many times, uh, I've been here for a few months, uh, we've been able to put together so many different actors, institutional and non-institutional, to produce uh, such a, I have to say, a high level uh, workshop. So uh, beyond the organizers, we have a, a Gruppo Esponenti Italiani, the trade agency, the, the foundation uh, of uh, um, Italian researchers and, and scientists, uh, under the key and reassuring uh, umbrella of the Italian Embassy in, in Washington and with a coordinating role by the Consulate General. Uh, a few are missing, uh, but I think uh, it's, it, this has been a very, uh, very good uh, team working. And when we look at the contents and the quality of speakers, both the Italian and the US, uh, I think this will be added value and this might also set a precedent for future uh, seminars because um, sustainability is a very sexy word today. Everybody's talking about sustainability, but tackling it in this way from so many different uh, dimension and with so many different experts, I think, uh, um, at least from, from my limited perspective, it's also a, a kind of a unique uh, um, experience. Uh, a final word to say, uh, I cannot but share, you know, uh, Richard R's pessimism about COP26, but uh, yesterday, uh, together with my uh, British counterpart, we chaired a webinar, unfortunately, but on uh, um, youth engagement in view of COP26. It was a, a follow-up of the Youth for uh, Climate Summit in, uh, held in Milan at the end of September. And we had, thanks to the webinar, thanks to the online connection, over 150 universities and colleges of the tri-state and Pennsylvania involved. So if it's a fact that the policy making uh, or decision making level, uh, we are late, uh, it's uh, another reassuring fact that the uh, awareness and engagement and commitment at youth level uh, is uh, greater and greater. And this, uh, I consider this very reassuring. So without wasting more words, uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you above all to the organizers and to ourselves uh, for uh, um, having promoted uh, this event. And uh, I can give you the floor to Fabio. Professor Finotti, thank you. Okay, the co-organizer is uh, Giampaolo Pioli, who actually transferred his office uh, at the Italian Cultural Institute in the last two days, and he is working for free. So I hope that he is going to stay there and to go, no, <laughs> but uh, I think that uh, this is a great, really a great uh, example of uh, uh, collaboration. Uh, and uh, first of all, uh, uh, the uh, words uh, of uh, the ambassador, uh, Mariangela Zappia, uh, at the first meeting uh, of the uh, Italian, uh, of the directors of the Italian Cultural Institutes uh, two uh, months ago. Uh, she was uh, speaking about uh, sustainability, uh, moved uh, in a way, inspired uh, the idea of uh, this uh, uh, forum. And then there was, of course, uh, the uh, connection uh, with La Voce. But I think that uh, we should uh, thank you, really, uh, Fabrizio De Michele. who is transforming uh, the um, consulate uh, really in a sort of crossroad of uh, the energies uh, who are working uh, here in New York. And uh, um, this is uh, why I think uh, that uh, uh, Italy apparently is unstable, but really is very stable, because uh, we are always able to work together and to put together our energies. And then there is uh, Antonio Laspina, there. Uh, this is uh, the second uh, 
uh, event we are organizing together uh, after the Medici uh, with uh, Soldani, his uh, uh, vice, uh, uh, and uh, uh, other people uh, of the um, uh, uh, Italian Trade uh, Commission, correct? Uh, and uh, so this is for us uh, a crucial example of uh, the System Italia, how the Italian Cultural Institute, uh, the Consulate General, and all the other people uh, in New York should uh, work uh, together because we are speaking different languages, but all these languages uh, intersect. And uh, uh, industries need uh, creators, need the creatives, need art, art need the technology, science uh, need the uh, finance. So we are all together speaking different languages, but we need uh, to meet. And there is also the ISNAF, the uh, um, Center for uh, the I, I, uh, Italian scientist in America, which is rep represented today uh, by Monica, who is uh, there. So thank you very much because uh, they are organizing a, pan a panel. But uh, uh, I think that uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, Mario Calvo Platero and the Jay. <laughs> Without uh, his insight, his advice and uh, uh, his suggestions at every time of the day and the night, this, could, uh, this event uh, would be impossible. And then uh, a person who is not here, Alessandro Medis, who is uh, uh, the great uh, architect who worked uh, in the uh, creation of the panel about uh, uh, the natural uh, sustainability. Uh, his son had a terrible uh, uh, accident in motor, he is not able to be here, but uh, uh, we have uh, his uh, guest uh, and uh, he is uh, the um, uh, advisor of uh, Biennale. I really would like to um, send him a, a heartful thank you. And, uh, and then all the journalists, the journalists who are for us not only people uh, who convey a meaning, but who create something. They are intellectuals. And some of them, actually, just as representatives of the category, uh, are moderating. Some other are also speakers, like uh, Laura Laposta, who is uh, there. Uh, and so thank you very much to the journalists, because we don't need only communication, but we need from the journalists the elaboration of what we are thinking and making. And uh, last uh, uh, of all, I would like to remind you that uh, there is a wonderful exhibition at the Italian Cultural Institute about uh, uh, sustainable textiles. They were uh, creating a sort of sculptures out of textiles. So the Italian Cultural Institute is open. You will see uh, it tomorrow. And uh, uh, it will be nice for you to visit uh, the room with this uh, uh, example. And, uh, now I'm happy to leave the podium to this great friend, I would say a brother, Gianpaolo Pioli. I counted 92 seconds when I was reading with my cell phone, but uh, this is our first joint collaboration with the Italian Embassy, the Council General, and the Italian Control Institute, with Jay, the Italian Trade Commission, as Isner. And for us, it has been a great experience and a real team effort. Like uh, Fabio said, many thanks must, not, must be given not only to the panelists, but also to the Italian correspondent in New York that generously accept to moderate at no cost all the discussion which will take place during the forum. For people who do not know, La Voce di New York is the first Italian and English digital daily newspaper in the US. We have reached a striking 200,000 unique monthly contacts with more than 9,000 subscribers on our weekly newsletter, Crossroads. Stefano Vaccara, which is with us tonight, is the founder and editor-in-chief of La Voce. While our trend is positive, is a positive one, we realize that the necessity of grow more rapidly. 
commencing in January 2022, we'll be launching a more dynamic and modernized version of La Voce di New York to include breaking news, complete coverage of New York and the United Nations, as well as the most relevant topic in the US, Italy, and around the world. Our professional journalist and commentator, along with our digital and graphic designer from work from both New York and from Italy. We have a correspondent on the West Coast, in Florida, Texas, Illinois, as well as in other states across the US. Our message tonight is simple. Sustainability for us is a marching order. We are an independent media outlet that aspires to become a unique digital platform oriented toward the business, cultural, scientific, and technological community, both for young Italians as well as for the Italian-American community in the US. And thank you for your support. Thank you, thank you, Gianpaolo. So dinner is served, uh, enjoy dinner, and we'll come back in a little while uh, uh, with our keynote speaker, uh, Tans Whelan. And, uh, uh, and I would just, while, while they are serving you dinner, I would like to ask uh, our friends, uh, Fabio, the Consul General, maybe to come here, Antonino, and Gianpaolo, so we can uh, we can take a picture. Please join join me here at the podium.
Okay, so we, um, we're going to have our uh, keynote speech now, and uh, it is my distinct pleasure uh, and honor to call to the podium Tansy Whelan, someone I've known for years and respected tremendously for her contribution and work on making sustainability and uh, business, let, let's say, compatible, considering that for quite a long while they were, they were very much... Uh, far apart and businesses were resisting in investing into lowering uh, CO2 emissions, uh, failing to see that it was indeed an investment uh, rather than a mere unproductive uh, cost. Uh, Tansi joined NYU uh, Stern Business School in 2015. She's clinical professor of business and society and she is the director of the Center for Sustainable Business. Tansi, what a pleasure to have uh, you with us. Please join me here and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mario, and thank you so much to the organizing committee, to the Council for Foreign Relations. It's a pleasure to be with you all tonight. Thank you so much. I think everybody here except for me speaks Italian, so thank you so much for uh, speaking English. I appreciate that. And unlike Richard, I cannot claim any Italian ancestry. I am so sorry. Uh, but it is a delight to be with you regardless. I also want to express my thanks to the leadership that Italian businesses have provided on sustainability. We've had the pleasure of working quite closely with Invest Industrial over the years with the Bonomi family and others. Uh, to really drive sustainability through the work they're doing. I also, in my prior work, uh, was lucky enough to work with Lavazza, um, where we were working with sustainability. I worked with Giuseppe Lavazza a bit, had the best cappuccino I ever had in Torino. Um, so uh, again, those are my Italian credentials. I hope they're good enough. Um, so we are now um, at a moment, as you know, where we are really uh, challenged as a society with needing to make a really radical transformation and pivot. And as we look at um, the negotiations coming up around climate change, and, and I agree, as we've heard earlier, that it's gonna be, it's gonna be um, difficult to move as quickly as we need to. This is the decade where we need to make change at scale quickly, because it is, like we've seen with pandemic, climate change is an exponential growth problem, right? At the pandemic, you see one person is sick, and then you have 100, and then all of a sudden you have a million and millions. And climate change itself, as well as a systemic exponential growth problem. Once you start um, uh, seeing the kinds of changes we're already seeing, they start to build upon each other. So as we look at these 10 years, the role of the private sector is critical. And with the private sector, of course, in addition to all of us caring about our futures, our children's future, our grandchildren's future, and the viability of our businesses, we also have to make the argument that there is a business case for this in order to be scale, able to scale up more quickly. So that's what I'm gonna talk to you about uh, tonight. Whoops, I, before people showed you my slides uh, ahead of time. So um, anyway, I'm, I'm trying not to do that. So we'll talk a bit about um, the business case quickly and I'm glad to answer any questions you have. So your uh, conference, which sounds fascinating and really interesting speakers, the focus is Sustainability from cost to profit. And indeed, that's the work that I've been doing um, at, at Stern. And I will put forward the assertion that sustainability does indeed create financial value. And I'm gonna show you how and why, and how indeed that creates the opportunity to scale up investment much more quickly from both investors and corporates. So at the Center for Sustainable Business, um, we just finished a meta-analysis of 1,000 plus academic studies looking that were um, uh, published over the last five years, looking at the correlation between environmental, social, and governance and uh, financial performance. We found, we, and we divided them between corporate studies and investor studies. We found on the investor side that 58% of the studies demonstrated a positive correlation between corporate financial performance and good sustainability performance. On the, um, and, and then we found that only about 8% of the studies demonstrated a negative um, correlation. On the investor side, we sound, found that about 33% of the studies demonstrated um, alpha, or in other words, outperformance of ESG investing or sustainable investing versus conventional investing. 
and another 26% demonstrated um, that ESG investing performed at par or the same as conventional investing. Only about 14% of the studies demonstrated that um, or found that there was a negative correlation between ESG and financial performance in an investment portfolio. We also did a deep dive into climate, and you can see here that investment strategies that incorporated climate change actually even performed better in terms of alpha at about 43% across these studies. The challenge here is this is correlation, not causality, right? So why? You could, you could look at this and say, okay, fine, but you know, maybe there's other factors that are causing this, this um, correlation here. Um, and why isn't there causality? Because what we're seeing is that generally corporates are not tracking the returns on their sustainability investments. So we don't understand, to use an American idiom when we look under the hood of the car, um, why they are seeing this type of um, outperformance. So the research we've been doing, both that we saw in this meta-analysis, but actually directly with corporates and investors, we're seeing that there are a number of different ways in which sustainability is driving better performance. Um, one is through improved risk management. Another is through driving operational efficiency. Um, a third is through sustainability driving innovation. And a fourth is through purpose and impact driving better performance in a variety of different ways. I'm just going to give you one example of each of these and then go into some sort of, sort of um, corporate work that we've been doing around understanding the business case. So if you think about risk, for example, um, and you're in coffee like Lavazza or others, uh, and um, you look at the impact of climate change which, uh, on coffee, which by the way, coffee is the second most traded commodity in the world after oil. It's something that I think most of us enjoy. Um, and when you look at what's happening due to climate change, you're seeing the extreme weather events creating enormous stress upon coffee production through increased droughts, increased rainy seasons, which is decreasing productivity, which is causing use of more chemicals to try to combat that, um, more water needed, uh, um, significant biodiversity loss, soil loss, et cetera. Um, also what's happening with climate change, and this is happening with a variety of different um, biomes, is that the um, uh, area in which the altitude at which you can grow high quality coffee is going is moving up the mountain. Think about that for a minute. How many tops of mountains do we have to grow high quality coffee in, right? So at a certain point you run out of places to grow that high quality coffee. In addition, um, when you look at where the coffee is coming from, we often have disruption of the coffee transport through the distribution due to again extreme weather events, even in this country during Hurricane Katrina almost all of the coffee coming into the United States was coming in through the Port of New Orleans. So at that time, you couldn't get your coffee into the United States. So thinking about this, if you're Lavazza or Nespresso or any of these other major coffee companies and you are not paying attention to climate change, you are in big trouble from a perspective of providing high quality, good co tasting coffee to your customers moving forward. Now thinking about operational efficiencies. So um, one thing that companies tend to do is think about pollution and waste as sort of you know, a headache. It's a compliance thing. I gotta do this because you know, I gotta do it because otherwise I'm gonna pay fines. But actually, if you think about pollution and waste, it's the ultimate operational inefficiency. You are buying more than you need to pay to dispose of what's left over. Does that make sense from a financial perspective? Absolutely not. So looking at, um, just to give you an example of this, a pulp and paper company called Domtar works um, in the United States and Canada, sells globally, uh, big, big producer of paper products, diapers, et cetera. So they were looking at the fact that um, they needed to dispose of their pulp and paper waste from their mills, very expensive to dispose of it. This is a bio-based product. So they looked at that and said, hey, you know, actually we can develop a fertilizer out of this product that is better for the environment than the nitrogen-based fertilizer that the farmers use, which by the way emits a lot of greenhouse gas emissions and is costly. 
And so we're gonna give this to the local community at a low price. And so what happened, the farmers now have a fertilizer that's better for the environment, that's cheaper for them, and Domtar, the company, no longer has to pay landfill disposal costs and actually has a small revenue from this um, product, right? So again, thinking about things in a completely different mindset about how you might create value rather than um, creating waste. On the innovation front, thinking about how sustainability is driving innovation, Nike um, came up with, uh, was, was looking at sort of two, two issues. One was they wanted to um, have a higher performance shoe, and the other is they wanted to deal with the problem that sneakers, um, uh, which um, for the traditional uppers, you have to stamp out those little pieces for the upper part of the shoe, and then you sew them together, which creates a lot of waste as you're stamping out all these little pieces, right? And also is time consuming. So they come up, came up with the Flyknit technology, which is a, res, a, a knitting recycled polyester into the upper, which created a higher performance shoe. It's 15%, or excuse me, 19% lighter than um, the traditional shoe and reduced 80% um, of the waste. Is a billion dollar plus business now for them and has actually been a category disruptor. If you look at this and you look around at sneaker companies, you'll see that many of them are using this process now, right? And they wouldn't have come up with that innovation had they not combined the lower performance shoe together with the waste reduction strategy. And then finally, if you, meant, if you remember, I said there were four areas. The fourth is around purpose and impact. So if you look at Unilever, who's made a commitment around the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan and building their Unilever Sustainable Living Brands, um, those brands, which have kind of a purpose orientation, like Dove or Ben & Jerry's or 7th Generation, has been growing 69% faster than the rest of the business, delivered more than 75% of Unilever's growth, and now 28 of those brands are in the 40 top brands, which is their billion dollar plus brands. Okay, so even with all this, people are still arguing the business case, why? Right, so people are not actually, as I mentioned, corporates are not monetizing the return on sustainability. And why not? Well, first of all, assessing it is complicated. And it's complicated because you have sustainability strategies that are not tied to returns from the beginning, right? You don't put, oftentimes companies don't put that in place. Secondly, your sustainability strategies are developed in one place and the outcomes or impacts are in a variety of different parts of the business. It might be in procurement, it might be in HR, it might be in um, marketing, um, and nobody is actually figuring out how to assess that return on sustainability and then aggregate it and tie it back up to um, the actual strategy that generated it. In addition, a lot of benefits in sustainability are intangible, such as reputation, risk mitigation, um, uh, innovation, employee retention and productivity. And companies aren't used to actually monetizing those types of returns, but they can, and I'll get to that. Um, also, finance, up until recently, wasn't really clear that this actually made money. So, you know, changing their financial, their accounting systems is a big deal. So why put, why do that if there isn't really a reason to do it? And finally, investors and board members have been asking for ESG data and finance data, but not how the two relate, right? So nobody's asking for those connections, and that's what I think we're also beginning to ch see change. So at Stern, Center for Sustainable Business, we've developed a methodology called ROSI, Return on Sustainability Investment. Invest Industrial has been a partner with us in, in developing this um, and supporting it. Um, and we have identified nine mediating factors that um, uh, drive better financial performance when you embed sustainability in your strategy and practice. And that includes improved customer loyalty, better employee relations, more innovation, better media coverage, more operational efficiency, better risk management, and improved sales and marketing, supplier relations, and stakeholder engagement. Now you can look at those nine factors and say, well, any kind of good management can drive that, right? All kinds of things can drive more innovation or more employee engagement. But what's interesting about sustainability is sustainability is really emerging as that next element of total quality management, that next um, paradigm shift that companies, when they're adopting, can begin to drive these types of um, benefits to the bottom line. 
And our um, methodology, you look at what's material in terms of major environmental, social, and government issues for the um, organization. And then, however, it's not at the strategy level, it's the practice level. It's how you implement your sustainability strategy that you can monetize it. We've been working with a variety of different industrial sectors from agribusiness to retail to apparel to pharmaceuticals to um, automotive. Um, with firms such as Invest Industrial, private equity firms, and so on, to understand and develop these um, methodologies. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. The first one I'm going to walk through is around automotive, um, where we worked with a number with uh, Volkswagen, Aston Martin, and um, General Motors to understand um, how sustainability was driving better performance, and we found that it was improving operational efficiency. Uh, reducing risk and contributing to innovation and growth. And for one company, we found that it contributed up to 3.7% in annual EBIT or revenues to net to the company. Um, the different types of strategies we saw, we looked, so we looked at sort of um, identifying what the key sustainability strategies were for the sector. And then we um, bucketed those strategies by where that value driver might be. So the first bucket is around natural resource, um, consumption, and we looked at operating efficiencies, improved sales and marketing, and so on. Another set uh, uh, that uh, reduced your risk. Another set around innovation, so new um, like electric vehicles, but also things like if uh, you were not, if you're not involved in automotive, you might know. But the the key way in which com car companies make their money is through the extra services that you buy when you buy the car. So there's a lot of sustainability services that. Um, like safety, but also um, environmental ones that you can purchase that make them real money. And then the stakeholder pieces. So to understand how you might think about this, right? So one sustainability strategy um, for automotive is to improve waste management. One practice is to recycle paint and solvent. When you recycle paint and solvent, you no longer buy the virgin stuff. You no longer have the waste disposal cost. And actually, they had extra left over that they were selling, so they had the recycled product. What's interesting here in terms of the business case is that accounting, and this is for every industry, does not include avoided cost in their analysis. So if you're looking at the internal return on investment for you as a company in terms of making your investments, and you're not including avoided costs, that's really problematic. Right? Because as we're looking more and more at circular solutions where we're going to avoid a lot of costs, that's got to be built into your analysis of, um, of the benefits. The other thing that, is ha that happened with for them, for example, is they weren't looking, while they knew that their waste disposal costs um, were reduced somewhat, they didn't tie it back to the waste reduction strategy. So what did we see? So for one company, we saw that their waste reduction strategy resulted in $235 million of contribution net to annual EBIT which they did not know, okay? And they did not know that because they weren't looking at the full panoply of benefits, the cost savings due to, due to the lower spend on version materials, increased net revenues from sales to recyclers, reduction in water costs, energy savings, and reduction in waste disposal costs. In another example, one of the companies, um, so in Europe, as you know well, the automotive manufacturers are responsible for end-of-life recycling the vehicle, unlike here. Um, and so one company was reusing 2.5% of the end-of-life uh, components and, re and selling 10% to recyclers. They had an annual net EBIT uh, contribution of $100 million. Again, they did not know. They were thinking of this solely as a cost of compliance, not of something where they actually could make money off of it. I'm going to go now to a couple of other um, sectors and um, uh, you know, finish up because I'm keeping you from your dinner. I'm so sorry. Um, so we started to look at, um, we've been looking at the apparel sector uh, and looked, for example, here there's a company called Eileen Fisher uh, that made a commitment around climate change. They, again, hadn't tracked the financial returns on that commitment. So they, um, as part of that commitment, moved away from air freight. They still have some air freight, but moved more to shipping and trucking. And so what we found is that there was $1.6 million um, less cost in terms of their transportation mix in 2019 from 2015 when they made that commitment. There also was a societal benefit in terms of total um, cost of carbon. 
But what's interesting here even was in 2020, their total cost went up, including air travel, so air freight, excuse me. And so we asked them, what's going on here? And they said, well, actually with the pandemic, the air freight costs have tripled. So um, their costs went up, but they had already begin, begun to you know, exit from, uh, from air freight. So their costs were much less than they would have otherwise been. Um, so they were managing for that volatility, which I think is going to be an ongoing issue for companies who are dependent on this form of transport. But again, it doesn't show up in, in, in the analysis, right? Um, so uh, uh, important to sort of think through these types of issues. On the employee retention side of things, again, with a parallel example, we worked with REI, which is an activewear company that is very focused on purpose and sustainability, has good analysis of um, their, uh, their sort of um, employee engagement around those topics. And so with them, we looked at how they had reduced turnover and hiring costs and increased productivity as a result of that focus, which totaled in net $34 million, or about 5% of their total um, cost for the year. My final apparel um, example is also from Eileen Fisher, who has uh, embraced a circular um, uh, economy approach. So they've created a, a program where they will take back gently used clothing from their customers. They'll give them a coupon to do that. What they found in doing this is that the coupon um, worked quite well. It was very effective. People came in and actually bought more product. So it, they had net um, uh, profit from the actual program itself, but also from purchasing of new products. But most importantly, Eileen Fisher tends to be um, a store for women of my age, of a certain age, and they've had difficulty in reaching a younger demographic, right? And so with this program, they brought in a younger demographic for no acquisition investment, right? It came in through the promotion that they got through this and through younger um, women being very interested in this kind of approach and also being able to buy the product at a lower price. Um, so we monetize that return on investment for them in terms of looking at both at the customer acquisition cost reduction and the increased in earned media. Again, not a typical orientation of companies to look at this, but real money, right, in terms of bringing, bringing it in. My final example, since we're in a climate change uh, uh, mode, was with a Canadian utility. So this utility, um, in Canada, the utilities are being required to get out of coal by 2030. And this utility had done an analysis of whether they should get out of this earlier with a sort of conventional financial analysis and um, asked us to work with them on applying ROSI to um, that analysis to determine if there were additional benefits if they were to exit from coal early. What we found in doing this was that they were both labor benefits because increasingly uh, the, 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 the brightest do not gonna want to go work for a company that has a, a problematic relationship to climate change. But more, but, um, more uh, from a bigger perspective, we saw that actually there was a real challenge for them around cost of capital, that increasingly investors are looking at companies with that kind of exposure and penalizing their credit terms. And that came out to about 20, uh, yeah, $27 million over the nine-year period of time. And then we worked on this with the CFO as a result of this analysis and their own analysis of the conventional dynamics, they decided to exit coal early. Um, finally, let me end, since we're um, in a UN week, with um, sort of a reflection that the UN Sustainable Development Goals create a really interesting roadmap for business in terms of where the financial opportunities are as well as the risks are. There is um, Business and Sustainable Development Commission did a really excellent report. If you haven't seen it, it's well worth reading. Looking at um, $12 trillion worth of business opportunities, 380 million jobs that could be created in four of areas around the sustainable development goals, food and agriculture, cities, energy, and materials, and health and well-being. Um, so there's real money to be made out of doing good and helping society, and like business does, solving the problems that we have today, which are, which are really challenging. So um, with that, let me thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to the group and uh, look forward, if we have time, I don't know, Mario, for, for any questions. Yeah? Okay, thank you. You provided a very interesting um, bottom-up view, if you pass me the expression, of why companies, in their best self-interest, 
should follow, um, you know, if you look at ESG and, uh, and green uh, as, as a path to additional profitability. My question to you, if we reach the point of no return, where that is enough of a motivator vis-a-vis -vis what you call an exponentially growing problem, or do you think there is an important role still to be played by public policy, and what is it that you would expect public policy to implement in order to accelerate this process? Yes. Thank you. I, thank you, and absolutely business cannot do this alone. <laughs> Um, and, and this is one of the challenges is that even with business leadership, we don't have sufficient governmental leadership and support. We need more governmental policy oriented towards incentives for the transition, all right? Um, and they, government has a lot of levers that they can pull and they are doing some. Um, but I think we need far more focus by government on how do you penalize bad practice? How do you support good practice? How do you help companies make this transition? Um, and in a way that we are not seeing accelerate as necessary. So I absolutely, government is critical. Any more questions? Okay. There, <laughs> in front of the crowd. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, in this room, you know, last century, in this place, we have uh, thoughts coming out from foreign affairs where America became the place where to look at the theory of containment and things where Cold War was started here. So we're talking now about uh, something different. We're talking about sustainability. And I'm asking you why America, United States, is not being able until today to be leading the world in the sense Europe, everybody else is confused because there is no a leading country. So do you think that, for example, Biden administration, the very late, is trying to uh, giving an approach or theory, a doctrine about sustainability? What is your take on the possibility that the United States is still be able for this century to lead in the world on sustainability? Yeah, thank you. I um, feel disappointed and embarrassed in my country that we haven't been more a leader on sustainability. Uh, you know, having lived and worked quite a bit in Europe, I would say one of the challenges we have in the United States is our focus on individual rights, which is both a strength and a weakness for us as a country. And one of the weaknesses associated with sustainability is the tendency of Americans, not all, but many, to see regulation and engagement around these issues as um, infringing upon their individual rights. And that gets manipulated by um, certain you know, types uh, to manipulate a frenzy, a political frenzy against that. So we have had real challenges with that. When I um, was in my previous job running the Rainforest Alliance, whenever we were working with companies, we'd, if we were working with American ones, we'd be working with their European offices first because that's where the market was going for the demand for the product. And I remember when Walmart finally came out with their sustainability um, dictates, uh, requirements, all of a sudden all the American companies were calling something, what is that sustainability thing? What do we need to do? You know, and the Europeans were like, we, you know, we got this, we know how to do this, right? So I, I think this is a real challenge. On the other hand, um, what I would like to say is that I do see um, the benefit of American approach um, is that we can move quickly, right? And we also don't, don't believe as much in government, so there's more leadership that comes from individuals and from the private sector. And so as we're seeing some major commitments by, you know, for example, the Microsofts of the world, um, really significant in, uh, be investments beginning to happen by um, financial institutions around ESG investing. So when, when Americans do decide to move, I do believe they can move quickly. Uh, but I do believe we're behind. And um, in terms of the Biden administration, I think that there was great aspirations. I mean, when, you know, in January when he made his announcement around the wide variety of climate and how he put actually business people in different roles and really built climate out across the entire, all of the administration, not just in depart, you know, environmental protection, but in actually in commerce and everywhere else, which is brilliant. And that's the kind of approach we need. And yet we're stuck. You know, and we're stuck for the reasons Richard talked about in terms of our political system, which is a whole other story, and I know you want to eat. So <laughs> anyway, a quick, quick answer to that. We have Francesca Forcella and then Andrea Pizzi.
Luciano, are there any other questions so that we close with these two, I think, otherwise the fish will delay. <laughs> it's sustainable fish, right? Such fish, exactly. Yeah. Yes, I'm Francesca Forcella. I'm moderating uh, one of the fashion panel tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And um, you talked about Eileen Fisher, that it's a wonderful example of uh, what we should do about sustainability. And I can, of course, make many examples of what's happening in Italy with someone like Brunello Cuccinelli that some yeah. have done something similar. But uh, my question, and, and I was surprised to learn from uh, professors and teachers in uh, American uh, University, every uh, college has a sustainability consultant in the fashion uh, um, uh, masters or whatever their studies is. And they confirmed to me that there is a different approach. One, that it's a fragmented one, that it's mainly the American one in which you have uh, uh, regu regu uh, certification and regulation that are very fragmented and that there is not a unified approach versus a more unified approach. And Italy seems to be a leader in this regard. So along with what Stefano was saying, how is it possible that in a country like uh, the United States, there is not uh, a more unified approach versus sustainability in fashion, that it's uh, the second uh, polluter, this is a, yeah. you know, they, so has a very bad reputation. And even though there are all these good intent, all these good intention, how could you translate these good intentions and these uh, recommendation for uh, the luxury uh, brands to uh, the fast food, um, uh, fast fashion, fashion. Uh, fast fashion uh, producers? And how could you reconcile all these good intentions with the, uh, the fact that uh, if I have uh, to make a, a big, uh, if I have to buy a garment that it costs a thousand dollars, maybe I will look into those uh, sustainability approach. But if I have to go on air tomorrow, I have uh, 10 shirts from Zara or from uh, mm -hmm. Ann Taylor that I have no idea where they're coming from. So if someone like me that I think it's pretty much educated, what about our kids? What about all the people that among a choice between uh, spending, uh, uh, you know, uh, $30 for a cotton, organic cotton shirt, then they would have to really choose a sustainable, uh, a, a more sustainable product. How do we reconcile all this good intent with what's happening on the streets? Mm. So um, I think part of the challenge there is around the consumer. Uh, you know, if there's a really excellent book called Cheap that was written about the American consumer culture. And you saw um, prior to the 1950s, there was a, when, when you looked at purchasing products, you looked at a suite of things. You looked at price, but you also looked at durability and artisanship and other things. And then in the 1950s, as a part of kind of our ramping up of using the excess capacity after World War II, you started to see a focus on price ultimately. That was it, you know, so people purchasing based on price. And we've seen that downward pressure sort of commoditization of products with all of us, myself included, being socialized into looking for the best bargain possible. Um, but I, I believe what we're beginning to see a shift in the younger generation, not only believe, I've actually, we do a lot of research, not in apparel because the data isn't available, but in consumer packaged goods where we actually have access to all of the, from barcodes, all the data of all the retail purchases and consumer packaged goods, and we've seen 55 in CPG, 55% of the growth comes from sustainably marketed products at a 40% premium. And there's more price elasticity um, around the sustainable products. So I, and this, and it's higher for millennials, but also Generation X and boomers are buying a lot of sustainable products. So I believe that we're on the cusp of a major shift and that those companies that are not recognizing that and making that pivot will fall behind. Andrea, last question. Andrea Piano, Global Finance. Yes, uh, no fashion for me, a completely different kind of question. You were talking about the positive correlation between sustainability and economic return or financial returns. And you also talked about ROSI, I don't know if you call it ROSI yes, or ROSI, 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 whatever. I wonder if, are you working on the opposite? Are you calculating what happens to the companies who do not do mm -hmm. absolutely na anything? I mean, you mentioned Nike, some of the competitors are copying them, others have a completely different policy. The bottom line is to bring the shoe that costs five bucks and right. whoever produces it in Sri Lanka or whatever it is. So I wonder if there, there are data on the other side of the story. Thanks. Yeah, so we have not done any research explicitly on that. 
Um, but I'll give you an example. I was talking to someone earlier about that tonight. So if you look at the consumer packaged goods space and you look at Unilever, Nestle, uh, uh, PepsiCo, Coca-Cola, and Kraft Heinz as an example. So most of the CPG companies are making a pivot. They're either purchasing small, upcoming, sustainable brands to bring innovation to them, or, the, or they themselves are changing the profiles of their own products, improving the nutri nutritional value, the sustainable sourcing, and so on. If you looked at Kraft Heinz, uh, some years ago, they actually were, when they were Kraft Mondelez together, they were actually investing a lot in sustainability. But then they were bought by 3G, who takes a financial engineering approach solely to their investments. Kraft Heinz has things like Kraft Mac and Cheese, Oscar Meyer Bologna, Velveeta Cheese, ugh, ugh. <laughs> Anyway, they have these kinds of products. Um, very highly processed manufacturers, which I'm sure makes all Italians shudder. Um, so um, what's happening with them is they are not making that pivot. They are mainly focusing on reducing costs um, when you look, there's no new acquisitions, there's no, I mean, there's like a little bit of in tweaking around the nutritional profile, but they're sticking with those products. There's still a market for them, but if you look at the stock price of Kraft Heinz versus the stock price of the other companies are making the, the, the pivot, Kraft Heinz is underperforming substantially, and I believe they will continue to underperform until and if they make a shift. So there's an example for you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Okay, dinner and main course is served. Have a fantastic rest of the evening. Thank you.